I just want to ask Michael, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself as well, where you started, how you got involved in anti-pornography efforts? Yeah, well, um, kind of similar to Phil, my first exposure was to magazines. Um, although uh, I had a lot of involvement with internet porn, um, I was still uh, active in a relationship with pornography. And, and I talked to people about the fact that it was a relationship. At first, my first exposure to the material was really more of a, you know, it was a novelty, it was kind of, it became a pastime. But then I started to, to use it when I, you know, discovered that you combine pornography with masturbation and then it just had an incredibly powerful effect on the neurochemistry of the brain. You know, it was kind of a technical way of saying it, but it was my high, it was a buzz that I would get. And in doing that, I found myself using pornography more and more to medicate my feelings. Like if I was, you know, had an argument with my dad or if I liked a girl at school, she didn't like me, just felt bad about myself, that was my great escape. You know, I could, I could go to pornography and then I wouldn't have to deal with my problems, with my issues. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, just like what Phil mentioned, there was a very clear belief system that was being communicated to me through pornography that really hasn't changed much over the years. It has a very clear picture of what it means to be a real man and a very clear picture of what it means to be a real woman. And I saw women, uh, just the way you see them in porn today, as being very sexualized, being very objectified. Um, their value is based on their body shape and size. Sure. And so that's the way that I started to act towards them in relationships. And I remember going through college, I was kind of in the, on the tail end, I'm 53 now, so I was in the tail end of the sexual revolution. And um, it was no big deal then, just like it's no big deal now to be sexual and to have any kind of sexual orientation, whatever. But I remember coming out of school thinking, you know, I'm going to meet this woman of my dreams one day, and I'm going to be able to set all this stuff aside, and then she's just going to be able to magically meet all of my needs. Mm -hmm. And that essentially happened. I met a woman, beautiful woman from, you know, a sorority girl from University of Georgia, and, um, you know, she just represented everything that I wanted in my life. And so as I as I got married and tried to establish a relationship and healthy intimacy with her, I found that in my very first year of marriage, I was drawn back to the material. Mm -hmm. And it was because I was dealing with a real person who had real needs, real emotions, real issues, and that caused more stress and more reasons for me to go find my great escape. Mm -hmm. So the problems didn't go away. I could numb the pain for a while, but essentially getting in this committed marriage relationship gave me even a stronger pull towards using the material. And I kept it hidden for, gosh, I guess, really a, quite, a, quite a while. I was in the technology industry, which was a kind of a dangerous place to be when you have an affinity for porn. And um, so when internet porn came out in the, I believe it was the early 90s, uh, I was in the industry, in the technology industry, so I was using internet porn before most people even knew what the internet was. And that had an, a dramatic impact on me. It was like a hockey stick turn in terms of my compulsive and addictive draw um, to the material because now I could experiment with different genres, different categories, and it was just feeding my brain exactly what it was looking for once it got normali normalized and tired of the things that I had been looking at. Mm -hmm. um, I have kind of a theme that had been at work in my life that I say, you know, what you feed grows and what you starve dies. Mm -hmm. And as long as I was feeding this relationship with pornography, I was killing the only real relationships in my life that mattered, that with my, my wife and my two boys. Um, eventually that spun out of control and uh, I started to really fantasize about having, um, having sex with other women uh, that weren't my wife and eventually I was just in a fair waiting to happen and I met a woman who really was like porn with skin on is what she represented to me and um, 13 years into my marriage had an affair something I'd never dreamed of doing before um, and uh, I was not only by then had I become addicted to the material but now I've been a, become addicted to this relationship and because it was an affair there was a, a buzz or a high that was going on 24 7 and quite frankly I just I wasn't willing to give it up um, Eventually, uh, my wife had become suicidal because she started to buy into the lies and the things that other people were telling her that, well, maybe it's, you're not being sexual enough, you're not being, you know, you're not meeting your husband's needs, maybe you need to lose some weight or change your body shape or whatever. And she was hearing that from people in the community as well as in the church right. that we were attending. And so she was filled with so much guilt and shame, had considered driving her minivan into a tree thinking maybe Michael and the boys would be better off with this other woman. You know, maybe it really is my fault. But that's a lie. Absolutely. Yeah, think, but, the, but she really believed that. I know? definitely want to talk about that because mm -hmm. I know that a lot of our supporters and, and probably the 
people watching right now are women who might be in a relationship yeah. like this. And it's so not their fault. It's not their yeah. fault. No way. No way it's not their fault. It's, 